everyone and welcome to Calvary Chapel Online. My name is Shara and it is my pleasure to be here with you this weekend. If you are joining us for the first time, we want to say welcome. We are so glad you are here. Say hey in the chat. Let us know where you're joining from and text the word NEW to 31352 so we can stay connected. If you're watching and you have kids, this one's for you. We have great online content that's available for all ages. Simply click on the link that's specific to that age group and find out what's available. All right, well, it's time to continue through week two of our study through Micah. Pastor Doug will be teaching through Micah three and four. So grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and journals and let's prepare our hearts for what the Holy Spirit has to speak to us. But before that, let us all worship our Savior together. Enjoy. Welcome to Calvary, everybody. Let's stand to our feet. Before we get started, why don't you turn to the person next to you and just say, hey, I'm glad that you're here. Let's worship Jesus together. He is worthy of our praise. Come on, sing this with us. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Oh, let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Good job. 
remember his faithfulness. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my Sweet. 
after me There's no wall you want kicked out Lie you want to hell Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you want kicked out Sing that together. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Can we thank him again? I'd love to pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, that is who you are. When we have these lies and these things that we're just telling ourselves about ourselves that are the exact opposite of the truth, the exact opposite of our identity, of what you say we are, what you say we're sons, we're daughters, we're chosen, we're accepted, we're loved, we belong. All of these things that every day we wake up with doubts and every day we wake up with these questions like could it actually be true again today? And you're here to tell us in a reckless love, you come sweeping through with words of I love you, you're chosen, I picked you. And so Jesus, we just wanna posture ourselves today in a place to say thank you and Lord, as we listen to your word, as we are convicted, as we are challenged, may we lean in, may we not run away, may we lean in and find out this whole time you've been running after us, you've been chasing us down because you love us. You're filled with mercy and you're filled with grace for us, unending and a fresh supply today. So Father, we say we're willing, we're ready, we're here with open hands. Speak, we're listening, Jesus, we're listening. This day is for you, our lives are for you, and we just say thank you in advance for the work you're gonna do. Everyone said, in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Doug. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. We're so excited that you're here. In fact, if it's your first time with us, we wanna give you a special shout out. It's gonna be a great day. We're in the middle of a series uh, through the book of Micah in the scriptures, and I think you guys are gonna be challenged today to become more like Jesus. And by the way, if you are a first-time guest, uh, we want to invite you to meet us. Uh, there's an area on the west side of the lobby called Connection Point. We've got a free gift for you for being our guest, and we'd love to just get to know you a little bit. And if you're joining us online, you can simply text the word NEW to 31352, and we'll connect with you there. Guys, enjoy the rest of the service. Hey. 
Hey, what's up, Calvary? Hey, we have something so exciting coming up. Our beach baptism is next weekend. If you made the decision to follow Jesus but haven't been baptized, this is for you. Join us next weekend at the beach just south of the Pompano Pier between 8.30 and 10 a.m. To learn more, just visit our FAQ page at calvaryftl.org slash baptism. Hey, so if you're age 55 and plus, sometimes friendships change or move on and you find yourself looking for more community. So here's a simple solution, a great way to experience community, mission, and encouragement. Check out the next meeting on October 19th, and all you have to do is go to calvaryftl.org slash legacybuilders to learn more and sign up. All right, so guess what? Thanksgiving is only six weeks away. And I can't wait because we get to celebrate God's goodness by sharing it with those who are struggling this year. To get involved, just visit calvaryftl.org slash thanksgiving. And just around the corner from Thanksgiving is, yep, you guessed it, Christmas. Operation Christmas Child is a chance to share the gospel of Jesus with hurting kids worldwide by donating a gift-filled shoe box. You can begin picking up boxes next Saturday at your campus. Then drop them off November 15th to the 21st before and after services. Visit calvaryftl.org slash OCC. Ladies, this is for you. Don't forget about the gathering on October 29th with our incredible keynote speaker, Joe Saxton. Grab your tickets at calvaryftl.org slash the gathering. That's it for us. We love you guys. We'll see you later. Morning, Calvary. It's so good to see you today. And for our campuses and our online community, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Any guests in the house? We are in a study in the book of Micah. So if you have a Bible, we'd love for you to open to Micah chapter 3. And in Micah chapter 3 and 4, we are going to see uh, what this ancient prophet has to say to his church today. So grab your Bible, Micah 3 and 4. If, if you also wanting to know, I want to I wanna know more, I want to follow along in, in a way that I can grow even deeper as a student of God's Word, we, we've provided a QR code on the seat in front of you. If you just scan it, you'll actually get all the notes and the verses from the service, some of the points, and even a chance to go deeper. If you go on our website, we have articles every day in a daily devotional right now on justice on the book of Micah. And so if you're a student of God's word, you're like, I want to know more about justice and mercy and the prophets and what God says justice is, we invite you to go online and get those resources so you can grow deeper in God's word. Also, if you scan that QR code, you'll also see there's a baptism coming up this Saturday. You already saw it in the announcements, but it's a chance for you if you've made a profession of faith in Jesus to go, now I want to go and make it public at the beach next Saturday. And so where the Atlantic Boulevard meets the Atlantic Ocean, you're going to see life change happening. So if you haven't been baptized, this is your opportunity. If you have been baptized, come and watch God at work changing people's lives. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to behold. And then finally, uh, any Calvary women in the house? Uh, Calvary women, raise your hand, make some noise. It's okay, it's Sunday morning, nine o'clock, it's okay. Oh, that was, oh, come on, you guys can do better. Calvary women, make some noise. All right, so all of the women of, of Calvary at, at all the houses, all the campuses are coming together October 29th. Make sure you are here. Joe Saxon's gonna be here as a special guest speaker. And this is a chance to invite a friend, your daughter, your mom, your grandma, your friends, and just get them here to hear an incredible uh, message of encouragement. And so... Uh, looking forward to a packed house of the women of Calvary, uh, October 29th. And now we want to pray and God, add God, ask God to steady our hearts and prepare us uh, to hear his word today. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that's open before us. And even as we read through the book of Micah on our own, it 
sometimes feels like it's, it's all over the place. There, there's doom and there's hope and there's words about the past and the present and the future and sometimes it's hard for us to even understand or receive what you have to say and so we ask you, give clarity to our minds and to our hearts and help us to hear what your spirit will say to us so that we can grow in our conviction of who you are, grow in a spirit of repentance, learn to receive your mercy in new and deeper ways and find healing. Father, have your way in us today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. That's all you know from Charles Dickens' novel, The Tale of Two Cities, because when you were in high school, you just read the cliff notes and hope you passed the test. It's a tale of, of two cities. And today, we're gonna read The Tale of Two Cities. In Micah chapter three, the tale of a city, Jerusalem. And it's bad, it's really bad news. And chapter four, a tale of a new Jerusalem. And it's good news, it's really good news. How many of you like to hear bad news before you hear good news? Yeah, this is gonna be really, really, really bad news. There are moments during this service where you're gonna feel your heart beat in your chest and you're gonna go, this is really, really bad. Because chapter three talks about the city of man. The city of man. When men are in control, when women are in control of a city. And what happens? Well, we know from the very beginning of the story of the Bible that God made the heavens and the earth and he placed in the crown of his creation, Adam and Eve, in this beautiful garden. And he wanted them to be kings and priests, to co-reign with him, to go and take dominion over the whole earth and to enjoy this beautiful shalom, the peace and justice and joy and fellowship of, of being in the presence of God. But we know Adam and Eve were given this free will, and they decided at some point in their journey, we don't want God telling us what to do. We want to decide what to do. We want to be the one who sits on this decision-making seat that no one has the right to tell us what to do. We'll make our own decision. And maybe if you have little kids, your four-year-old, your six-year-old, at some point has said to you, mom and dad, when you want them to go to bed or brush their teeth, you're not the boss of me. And you're like, oh, this little child that I loved and nurtured and cared for is looking at me and saying, you can't be the boss of me. And essentially, that's what the city of man is. Sure, we love God and believe in God when he's doing what we want, but when he asks us to do something we don't want, we somehow will say, I don't want you to be the boss of me. I'm going to. And as we read through the scripture. Well, there was a church father named Augustine. He would talk about the city of man and the city of God. And he would contrast these two things, much like we're gonna see in Micah 3 and 4. And the first time we see men and women build a city in the, in the Bible is Genesis chapter 11. And that city is later called the Tower of Babel. And that city is built on human pride and human rebellion. God says, scatter and go. I wanna give you this beautiful dream again after the flood. And the men and women say, no, we're gonna stay here. And we're gonna build a city that reaches to the sky and we're gonna make a great name for ourselves. The first city in the Bible is built not on rock and roll. That's Starship, that's the 80s. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry. The best music was in the 80s. This city was built on human pride and rebellion. And so we're gonna see that in Micah chapter three. But I want to let you know the good news is coming because the city of God, the new Jerusalem that God's going to build, where God's in control, is going to give us this beautiful sense that even when judgment comes, mercy is going to follow because we talked about this idea last weekend, that judgment and mercy are two sides of the same coin. They both exist in the very heart and character and nature of God. So no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad the warning, no matter how bad the judgment, God's mercy always shows up and wins in the end. And so this, as the people of God, should give us this deep sense of, <sighs> so everyone, hold your heart. Because right when we get into Micah chapter three, you're gonna feel it. And I want us to ask this question as we go through this prophet, because this is not just about what happened back then. 
Michael lived 700 years before Jesus. So 2,700 years ago, this prophet spoke about what was happening in the city. And sometimes we can go, oh, that was for people back then. But the question we want to ask ourselves is, today, this application of what this prophet said, who has the right to run our life? Who has the right to be king? Who has the right to be the boss of us? And all of us make that decision with our lives. And so as we look at this tale of two cities, I want that question to be going through your mind. Who is the one who can tell me and speak into my life and guide me? So Micah chapter three, verse one, here we go. Then I said, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice, you who hate good and love evil? who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh and strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. Good morning, it's Sunday. (laughs) If you brought a friend, really, you know, it's, it's gonna get better, so just hold on. I mean, Micah starts with this very visceral thing saying, the leaders of Israel have so loved evil and hated good that actual cannibalism and people consuming people is happening. In fact, at the time this was written, Ahaz was one of the kings of Israel. He sacrificed two of his sons in fire to appease another idol, the king of his mind. And so we see it's, it's bad. And so what's God's response in verse four? They will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time, he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. And this is what the Lord says. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace if they have something to eat, but prepare to wage war against anyone who refuses to feed them. Therefore, night will come over you without visions and darkness without divination. The sun will set for the prophets and the day will go dark for them. And the seers will be ashamed and the diviners disgraced. And they will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. You have prophets who will only speak if they get paid their due. You have injustice happening with impunity. People are doing what they want to do and no one will stop them or even say a thing against them. And what is God's response? Not only will I not give them visions, but I will also hide my face from them. Now, that phrase might not mean a lot to us, but to a Hebrew, to an Israelite, the idea that God would hide his face from his people is one of the most horrific statements that you could hear. Because remember the the blessing that Aaron was supposed to speak over the people, that God would bless you and keep you, and that he would be gracious to you, and he would make his face shine upon you, and he would give you peace. This was the blessing that every Hebrew, every Israelite wanted to hear, that God would shine his face on you, that God would turn his face toward you. And now God is saying, the condition of the heart of my people is so bad, not only will I not answer them, I'm not gonna turn my face, I'm gonna hide my face from them. I'm removing my favor. There is no answer from God. And now verse eight, here's the posture of Micah's heart. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness, Her leaders judge for a bribe. Her priests teach for a price. Her prophets tell fortunes for money. And yet they look for the Lord's support and say, is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become like a heap of rubble. And the temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. If you're a note taker, you can write down the simple idea That the city of man looks alive even when it's dead. You see, at the time that Micah was saying this, Israel, Judah, the the nation, was actually going through a time of thriving. Through Jotham and and Ahaz, 
and Hezekiah, there, there were building projects. There were the building of the military. There were renovations that were happening. On the outside, a lot of really great things were happening. And Micah says, even though it looks really good, the economy is good, the military looks strong, and the infrastructure is being built, and all these beautiful things are happening. This nation is dying, and you don't even know it. You don't even perceive it. The, the kings and the, and the prophets and the priests, they're doing what they do for money. They, they despise justice. They distort what's right. They judge for a bribe, teach for a price, prophesy for money. But here's what I love about Micah. Micah is not for sale. What do I mean by that? There's something about the prophets that say, you couldn't pay me any amount of money to say the things you want me to say. I'm gonna say, filled with justice and might, what God Almighty tells me to say. And that is a beautiful thing. Because there are still churches in this nation that will preach the gospel no matter how much influence wants them to preach something else. I wanna say this, if you're, if you're part of a church, if you're new here, you're part of a church, like, you know, if I make a a big donation, then maybe, maybe I can get the pastor to go in this agenda or that agenda. I just wanna say this, you're gonna waste your time here at Calvary Chapel because we're gonna teach God's word regardless of what type of influence is exerted to have a certain agenda taught here. We are teaching the, the gospel of Jesus, we're teaching the Bible, and we're gonna trust that God's gonna bless the teaching of his word to bring conviction and repentance and healing and hope because that's what the gospel does every single time, right? Micah is not for sale. In a world of cowards, in a world of people who, who, who do what they do for influence or, or financial gain, he's gonna speak with a sense of conviction. And, and there's two phrases that he uses in verse nine. Uh, he says, the people here, they despise justice and they distort what's right. And we talked about these two Hebrew words last weekend, but we're gonna, we're gonna do a bit of a review because we wanna see what did that mean then and what does it mean now? So last week we talked about the system of justice. It's the Hebrew word mishpat. Everyone say mishpat. mishpat. This is over 200 times used in the Bible, this word for justice where God says, I have put into the Hebrew community a system of justice. That you wouldn't use your power to exploit the weak, but you would also use your power to support the weak. And so not only do we see people using their power in the book of Micah to hurt people. But we also see their ability to help people sort of sitting on the sidelines. Remember last week we talked about in these 200 times we see the word mishpat, much of, of these commands of justice are caring for the quartet of the vulnerable, the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, the poor. And what's happening in this time and, and what happens in our time often is there's a sense of distance a sense of distance between those who have and those who don't have, those who have spiritual power, those who have political power, those who have financial power, but there's a sense of a distance because distance creates this sense of apathy sometimes. Well, that person's so far away, or I don't even know that person. You think about the way that distance works. If, if something's separate, the more it's separated, the more it's not gonna be just. And so, if you separate yourself from the widow or the orphan, the immigrant and the poor, then you can feel so self-satisfied that you love God and you're serving God and you're going to church, but, but actually the distance actually creates a little bit of fear. I wonder why they, I wonder why those people. And that fear can create suspicion. And that suspicion can even create animosity and the dehumanization of people that are far away from you. And here's what religion does. Religion creates distance between groups of people. Remember the Pharisee that Jesus told this story about? He's praying in church. God, I thank you that I'm not like him. Feel the distance. I'm righteous. He's not. I follow God. He doesn't. My life is blessed. His is not. Thank God I'm not like him. Religion creates distance. The gospel closes distance. Part of the reason why we have these vision teams, we talk about reaching our community and changing our world here at this church is because there are people in prison right now, just a few miles from here, but you can't see them. There are kids that are modern day orphans in foster care that are blocks away from this church, but, but you can't see them. 
There are elderly people right now in facilities that need someone to visit them, just to look in their eyes and remind them that they matter to God. But you can't see them. And you can go through your whole Christian life and, and have this distance between you and people that are in need. In fact, if you think of the last couple weeks and you're like, I really haven't, I mean, come into contact with lots of people in need, it's because there's this, this distance. And, and here's what the, the gospel does. It compels us to go, I wanna find out where people are in need and close the distance and learn to act in justice. Because it's not just the sin of commission, but the sin of omission. Something I know I should do, but, but I don't do it. This, these laws of mishpah were meant for God's people to lean in and walk toward the mess and say, how can I help use my resources to serve and support those who are weak and vulnerable? But Micah says to the people, you despise justice. It's like you don't care about those people who are being crushed by life. And sometimes, again, we can have this super thin theology about justice and mercy. Not only uh, does Micah say they despise justice, he says they distort what is right. It, this is the word for the righteousness of God, that, that all of the mishpah is, is rooted in the very nature and character of God, that he's the one that defines what is right and wrong, what is just and unjust, and that's the Hebrew word sadaka. Everyone say sadaka. You're like, man, I'm learning Hebrew in church. This is awesome. God is the one who made us. He's the one who designed the world. He's the one who is the author of right and wrong. And sometimes, actually more than sometimes, often, when God says, here's how I made the world and here's why I made you and here's who you are and here's your purpose and identity and here's what's right and wrong, we often say, well, yeah, but, but in this one area of my life, I want the seat. I want to decide. And so what's happening here is people are picking and choosing what part of the righteousness of God they'll embrace and, and the part that they will reject. And, and one of the things that we see in this time is, is the sacrifice of children. It's sort of horrific when you read it. But both Ahaz and Manasseh, kings of Judah, took their sons and put them in a fire and burned them to death. Because somehow they thought the favor of an idol or a deity would help the crops or the economy and it would serve their personal interests. And you think that's so horrific and so barbaric, but this has happened through the centuries. And in Rome, if there was a child that was unwanted, usually a girl or a child with disabilities, that child that was born in the first century was taken and placed on a rock. And this is called exposure. And the weather or the animals would consume that child and it was part of common practice. And it was the Christians, the early Christians, who would take those children and adopt them as sons and daughters. But today, we still see this through abortion, where men and women make the decision, this child is, is not wanted, this child is, is inconvenient, this child is gonna affect my life in a negative way, and so behind closed doors, I make this decision. And I wanna say this with a, the, the, the deepest sense of sobriety, because I know that there, there are many men and women here who have who've made that decision. So, so I want you to hear me. God has created human life. He says to the prophet Jeremiah, before you were born, I, I knew you and had a calling for your life to be a prophet to the nations. Psalm 139, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together in your mother's womb before one breath of your life comes to be, before one day of your life is written, I made you, I know you, and my plan for you is good. Somehow, in this nation, we've decided that a group of nine people sitting in a room can decide when life begins or what, 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 what value it has. We, we, we have this kind of idea that, well, because something is constitutionally permitted, it becomes a right, it becomes a way of life. And, and God would say, well, if you let me sit on the throne of your life, here's what I wanna say, that we should value the life of every person who is born and every person who is unborn, whether they are red or yellow or black or white, whether they are old or young or male or female, that's what the image of God is in people and that's what righteousness is, right? That's, that's this side of the coin. But I also wanna say, if you've, if you've committed the sin of abortion, God's mercy is coming for you in such a beautiful way. If you just think it's the judgment and God is angry, that you live in guilt and shame, know that the mercy of God is greater than any sin you can commit and his forgiveness and his healing, his redemption is waiting for you to say, God, forgive me, heal me, 
and begin to redeem my life because some of the most amazing stories in this room are men and women who have gone through that and experience God's healing and redemption, and so that's why we love the mercy of God. Aren't you grateful for the mercy of God in our lives, right? We can often make sin a human right, and we should be wise not to let that compensation happen. You know, we said last weekend that sometimes our ideology will inform our theology, that the voices we listen to out there will affect in here. So I wanna share with you a few more things that we're seeing that, that, that we see in here, but they're happening now 2,700 years later, and we need to be thoughtful as the people of God about them. So, so I wanna talk to you about this, this idea right now that's creeped not just outside the church, but inside the church of this ultra-nationalism that we see happening in America. It's something we see in the book of Micah. It's the type of, of nationalism that says, we are the greatest, and there's nothing that anyone can do to stop us. It's filled with pride. It's, it's different than patriotism. Listen, patriotism is a beautiful and humble awe that God has blessed us in the nation that we're in, that men and women have laid down their lives, the men and women who served in the military to give us the freedom that we have, and there's something beautiful about the humility and generosity of a nation who hasn't even yet lived up to its ideal dream. And that is something we should celebrate. It's something that the Bible commends us to as the people of God, to honor the king and pray for the, the nation and serve and love the people in a country. And that is beautiful and holy and awesome. And I just wanna say, if you are born or you're an American citizen, it is a great and awesome privilege that we live in this country. And if you're not even from this country, we're glad that you're a part of this beautiful nation. And that's a good thing. But what's happening in the book of Micah and what's happening in corners of the church is, is people want to take the, the cross and they want to wrap it in the American flag. And they want to say that the, the, the way that God sees the world is through this lens of America. And that means if we have to take something by force, that the ends will justify the means. And that the power used for selfish purposes is one of the most toxic combinations that can happen in a country. And that you can lose your way because that's exactly what happened 2,700 years ago. We're not afraid of Babylon and Syria. We have a strong military. We have a good economy. We're not, we're not afraid because God has blessed this nation and nothing bad's gonna happen to her. And God says, you didn't even realize I've left you. Like Samson, you didn't even realize the spirit of God had left him because there was this level of presumption in them. And the justice of God would remind us that we should hold everything with this deep sense of humility and, and not let the ideology of the world creep into the church. On the other side of this ultra-nationalism, what we see creeping into the church is this, this idea of, of, of critical race theory and how there's this framing of, 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 of oppressors and people who are oppressed and this, this epic battle that only can be solved by revolution, that anyone in power cannot be trusted. And again, ideology leading theology. And, and we as the church, we need to be able to reframe some of these conversations and say, not what does the world say, but what does the Bible say about justice? And so there's a pastor, and maybe you've heard him, his name is Dr. Tony Evans, and he's been speaking uh, uh, prophetically to our nation for 30, 40 years, right? I was a college kid listening to him. I can't believe how long he's been teaching. He says, you know, we want to reframe these type of conversations, and so he reframes this conversation between this ultra-nationalism where people wrap the cross and the flag or this ultra kind of uh, liberalism where people say, we're gonna wrap the cross in gender or race. And he said, let, let, let's create um, a new framework based on what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, that God is creating a kingdom race theology, that he is making Jews and Gentiles one, that he's making our primary allegiance, not the color of our skin or the background of the country we live in, but he's making our primary allegiance Jesus and Jesus alone because he's making a new family of Jew and Gentile and red and yellow and black and white. And this is what biblical justice, this is what biblical mercy, this is what the gospel looks like in a church. And so as the people of God, we wanna be so cautious not to despise justice or to distort what is right. And I just want to take a minute, since I'm offending people, I want to offend one more group of people. Um, <laughs> those of you who that are young, you're a teenager, you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s, but this actually applies to all of us, not just Gen Z and the millennials. But we've been taught from our culture. You know what? You can be whoever you want to be. If you just look inside, 
and you find out who you really feel like you are, and you follow that feeling, you will find true freedom and true joy. You can be whatever gender you want. You, you can be whatever person you want. You can be whatever religion you want. You can take a little from every bit of faith, and you can be right before God and filled with joy. And, and I just want to say, it's a lie. You've been lied to. And if you follow that trail long enough, you will find it leads you to a dead end because God has not changed his mind. You see, our goal is not to look in. Our goal is to look up. Because if we ask God, who am I? What is my identity? What is my purpose? How do I find a sense of belonging? Then he'll remind us that he's given us a word that tells us these truths that lead up to life and godliness. This idea of what is just and right is not defined by us. We're not the ones who sit on the throne and say, this is right and this is wrong and this is my opinion. No, God says, I made you, I made the world, I know what's right. Don't be the person who says, you're not gonna be the boss of me because that's what the city of man is made of. Micah says, if you continue to live this way, God's gonna hide his face from you. And so we as the people of God, we just want to ask ourselves this question before we move on to the city of God. When, when is the last time you felt a sense of conviction for a sin in your life? A sense that you violated the laws of righteousness or justice. You treated another person as if they weren't made in the image of God. You have that secret sin that you think doesn't bother or hurt anyone else, but in the private place, you know it's hurting the heart of God because you're violating his sense of righteousness and justice. And if you can't think of a time in the last month or two where you felt that conviction, God, I'm sorry, God, forgive me. Saying to a person, I'm sorry, forgive me. It happened to me uh, yesterday twice where someone walked up and said, you know, here's what I said and I'm so sorry, that's not what I meant, will you forgive me? And there's something so refreshing about the humility for you to say, God, forgive me for what I said or that thought process I had. There's something so beautiful about that sense of conviction because that sense of conviction leads to freedom. You see, in this time, uh, Micah says, you know, not only... Will God hide his face from you? But his, his counterpart, a prophet named Amos, would say something in even stronger language about people who will come to church and sing songs of praise, but live lives where they despise what is right and distort what is true and live unjustly. L listen to these words. These words are hard to hear, but this is what the prophets do. They stir us. This is Amos speaking for God. I hate I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. When you read that, it's sort of, sort of jolting. <laughs> like, wow. God's saying, don't come to church and sing your songs when there's a hidden sin in your life and you're pretending like everything's okay. Where you're deciding to say, God, I'm gonna do the parts of, what, of your word that I like, but not the parts of your word I don't like, but I'm gonna sing songs anyway and I'm asking for your favor and blessing because, God, you're not gonna do anything to me because your grace is so powerful that I can pretty much do whatever I want and you'll still forgive me, Right? God says, stop singing. Do what's right. Do what's just. Let justice and righteousness roll like a river. Now, if this sounds a lot like, man, this is, this is way too heavy, and the idea that our religious activity is, is offensive to God is, is such an Old Testament idea, well, I want to give you the words of Jesus, because sometimes we can do this with the Bible. And this is why I say we have a thin theology of justice because sometimes in the Bible we can say the Old Testament, these prophets, oh, that was the God who was angry, the God of justice. But, but Jesus came and he's the God, God of mercy. But how, how many of you know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? 
Jesus is, a, is an exact expression of the Father, two sides of the same coin, a God of justice and a God of mercy. And so Jesus walks into the religious scene 700 years after Micah and Amos shared this indictment of people of God who are worshiping with this deep sense of hypocrisy in their hearts. And he says this to these religious leaders, woe to you Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint and rue and all kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Jesus walks onto the scene of people who are worshiping every week. They're tithing, they're praying, they're fasting. They're doing all the right things on the outside. And he says, woe to you. You're doing all the things on the outside, all this religious activity, but it's actually offensive to God because the heart of mercy and justice is not in you. There's a deep disconnect between your worship time and your connection to God's heart. And so you look at Micah chapter three, and you're like, this city, the city of man is a mess. God is hiding his face, revelation has ceased, idolatry is thriving, truth and justice die in the streets. This is bad. This is really bad. But now Micah, like the prophets we see through the Bible, is gonna turn a corner. He's gonna say, although this city is bad, there's a city of God that's coming that's greater, and, and now he's gonna announce to us our impending redemption, our imminent hope. And so in chapter four, you're gonna see this, this abrupt turn. You're like, whoa, whoa, how can these two things be right next to each other in the Bible? Because this is the tale of two cities. And this city in chapter four is now the same city, Jerusalem, but now it's the new Jerusalem. And we're gonna watch what happens because in between chapter three and chapter four, a king has come. A Messiah has come. And his name is Jesus. How many of you are grateful for Jesus, the Messiah, the king, who's gonna be the difference between these two cities? And for homework, if you're a student of the Bible, I want you to read Psalm 72 because Psalm 72 is a psalm of David and Solomon and it is the hope of Israel that a king would come that would endow the nation with justice and live a life of righteousness and begin to change and turn upside right all that was wrong in the nation of Israel. In fact, if we think about uh, the way that the, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people saw Messiah, Messiah means king. The word Christ means king, that Jesus is king. In the early church, Christians were not killed because they said, oh, Jesus is the Lord of my heart. To Nero, they would say, Jesus is Lord of all. He's the king of all. And that's why Christians were martyred in the first century, because they had this deeply held belief. Listen, the longest standing, strongest political belief of the church over 2,000 years is this simple statement. Jesus is king. That is the shared political belief of every believer of Jesus Christ for the last 2,000 years. And it is a subversive belief that no matter who is in control in the world, that Jesus is still king. And that, again, is what is gonna make the difference between chapter three and chapter four. So are you ready for some good news? Because that was really bad news. Are you ready for some good news? This is what Jesus can do to his city. Micah 4, 1. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. As the highest of the mountains, it will be exalted above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. Someone say, amen. And many nations will come and say, come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And the law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for the strong nations far and wide. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Look at the contrast in the first Part of the city of man. People weren't listening to what is right. They weren't finding justice in the courts. They weren't experiencing the peace. The nations were at war. In the city of God, there will be no more war. There will be justice. There will be people not streaming from the city, but flocking to the city because the presence of God, the justice, the shalom of God is existing in this new 
Jerusalem. And now for you fans of Hamilton, uh, Micah chapter four, verse four, uh, George Washington uh, got his, his verse in Hamilton from this. Everyone will sit under their own vine and everyone under their own fig tree and no one will make them afraid for the Lord Almighty has spoken. A time of peace and prosperity and joy and security exists in this new city, this city of God. And all nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever. Aren't you looking forward to that city? It's gonna be a really, really, really good day. In verse six, he says, in that day, I will gather the lame. I will assemble the exiles, those who have been brought to grief. And I will make the lame my remnant, those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day forever. You see this beautiful picture of him saying, this new city is not made up of all the powerful power brokers, the priests, the prophets, the kings, but the foundation of the city are the lame and the weak, the exiles. All those people who are being crushed in the first city are now reigning in the second city, which is great hope for all of us. When some days you feel like, God, do you hear? Do you care? What's gonna happen in my life? He says, I'm gonna exalt you all the way to the top and foundation of this new city. And so... I want to share with you this simple idea. If the first city looks alive but is dead, this second city, the city of God will prevail even when it looks like it won't. So when you look at the news and you're like, man, the church is not winning right now. Christians are not winning right now. <laughs> Frankly, it feels like God is not winning right now. Even though it looks like the church is not gonna prevail in the end, we have a promise on the church that the gates of hell will not prevail against her and this new city will happen. It doesn't say may happen, hope happen. There is a definitive nature in the voice of Micah. This will happen because God has declared it and we can have this deep sense of confidence. When God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank every single time, right? This is the beauty of this promise. He, he talks about exile, even though you're going to go into exile into Babylon, there'll be men and women like Daniel and Nehemiah and Esther that will serve in exile in ways that bring the gospel forward, not just for Israel, but for all of the nations. Look, look at verse 10, and you will go to Babylon, and there you will be rescued, and there the Lord will redeem you out of the hands of your enemies. But now many nations are gathered against you. They say, let her be defiled, let her eyes gloat over Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Because this is gonna be a great restoration of God's people. And he brings up this idea that I think all of us wonder about. See, if I was king, if I was running the world, it wouldn't happen that way. You wouldn't watch the mess get that bad and you wouldn't wait that long. I mean, if I was in charge, I would use different kinds of people. I would do it in a different time frame way quicker. But God's ways aren't my ways. And I'm not on the throne, he is. And he invites us into this beautiful surrender. If you could just embrace that you are not the boss of your life or the boss of this world, and that I know better than you because I have a higher view of you, a view than you and, and a deeper sense of justice and mercy than you and I'm working a plan that's bigger and greater than you that will one day when you see it fulfilled, it'll take your breath away. Because Isaiah would say the same thing. My thoughts, God says, are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. As far separated as the heavens are from the earth, my ways are higher than your ways. And this, again, is a really really, really good thing. God's grace over our lives, his mercy that pursues us, his ultimate plan of redemption for this planet is good and beautiful. And so I wanted to close with this singular question. So knowing there are these two cities, the city of man and the city of God, and knowing we live in time and history in between these two cities, the question for us as the people of God is this. Which city are you building? Hmm. Yeah, which city are you pouring out your time and energy and, and labor for? Because the city of man would demand you pour out time and labor and energy for, for it. 
And God only gently invites us to pour out labor for his, his kingdom. So, so I want you to think with me for a second. That at the time that, that Micah was writing, these kings, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, they were working 50, 60 hours a week building walls and, and aqueducts and, and, and supporting the economy and, and rebuilding the temple and establishing all these things that at the end of the day when Babylon came were completely wiped out. Their entire life work flattened, reduced to rubble, like an empty field. How would you feel if you worked 50, 60, 70 hours a week to build your portfolio or your business? All those social contacts and that media platform. And then when you died, it's all gone. Someone divided your company after you died, split up the assets. Everyone wasted all the money and all of your life's work was for nothing. Oh, that would be like so frustrating. Right now you're frustrated. You're saying, oh, that better not happen. Happened to Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. And if you want to know what that feels like to, to waste or to invest your time and energy into all the wrong things, read the book of Ecclesiastes. A man who reflects on all the life's work and he didn't build the character of his self and the character of his kids and all that he built was blown away. And then on the other side, God doesn't demand, build my kingdom. He invites you, hey, you could invest in the eternal. And at the judgment, all that's burned away, like the wood, hay, and stubble, all the stuff of the world that's not gonna matter at the end of the day, What's left is what you invest in the kingdom of God, the people that you invest in, the things of the kingdom that you contribute to, the way that you do justice and mercy in a city will live on forever as an eternal legacy. And so I wanna close with this verse in Peter because as we think about how God has called us to be kings and priests and reign with him, Peter takes this idea in his first letter to the church and he writes this about our identity. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Remember that original idea that God had in Eden? that we would be a kingdom of priests. We see it in the book of Revelation that when Jesus comes back, he is taking us, a group that deserved judgment. He's pouring his mercy on us. We were not once a people. We were once far away from him, but in the send of his son, Jesus, we've been made new, given a new identity and a new purpose, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a special possession of God. And in a couple weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how does a special possession of God, how does a chosen people, how does a royal priesthood do justice in a city 2,700 years after this moment? And what does that look like? Because God is inviting us into this to lean in. And it's all because, well, we're gonna read this next week, so hopefully you come back next week. In Micah chapter five, a king is born in a little city called Bethlehem. And Micah wants us to look closely at this king, born in an unlikely city at an unlikely time because his name is King Jesus. And we're looking forward to celebrating that next weekend. So come back and join us. And let's take a moment now and pray. Father, we ask that you would steady our hearts. You'd bring... Again, that sense of conviction or comfort. You know what we need right now. And reading the, the prophets is, is jolting. It's sometimes disorienting. But Father, we thank you that your warning comes out of love. That even your wrath is an expression of love. Because you care for the souls of people. And so Father, right now, we would pray that you would align our hearts to your justice and righteousness. That we would... Maybe look this week to, to close the distance between us and someone who's in need and find a way to serve them and in a private way, honor you. Thank you that you invite us to build 
your kingdom and not just our own. Thank you that you invite us to use the power you've given us to serve and not just to make it all about us. And so, Father, make us a just and righteous people by your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Hey, before I say amen and before we close our service, we want to give a simple invitation to you. If you don't know Jesus, if you, if you don't know that you've been forgiven for your sin, so we want to make a simple invitation. And I want to use this simple idea that we talked about in the beginning because often if we think about Adam and Eve, we're like, why, why did they do that? In a perfect situation, given free will, they chose to say to God, you're not going to be the boss of me. I want to sit on the seat. I want to be the CEO, the decision maker in my own life. I don't want anyone else, even God himself, telling me what is right and what is wrong. It's that willfulness that separates us from God. It's called sin. We usurp God's authority. We say Jesus is king or God is king. We may even believe in God and believe in Jesus. But listen, think about this. Satan, right now, could make a similar confession that many people make in church, that Jesus is the son of God, that God sent his son Jesus to die for the sins of the world, and on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. And that right now, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, and Satan would affirm that all of those things are true. Because what saves a person is not knowing something here, it's knowing something here. Satan refuses to bow his knee, to get off the throne. His original sin was looking at God and saying, I will ascend to your place. You're not going to be the boss of me. And I did that for years. I knew all the stories in the Bible. And there were moments that I, I believed and didn't believe that this was a real event in history that Jesus came into the world. He lived this life. He died to be not just the fulfillment of all the prophecies of this king of Israel that would come, but the savior of the world. But it didn't change me until I had to make a decision to get off of this seat and say, okay, God, in this area of my life or all these areas of my life, take control. You're king. You're a Lord. I want you to run my life. And, and, and getting up off that seat is gonna feel out of control. It felt so out of control for me. What if I get up out of the seat and God messes up my life? What if he sends me like to Africa or something? That'd be horrible. And that's because I didn't know the heart of God. I thought, well, if I give up this seat, then God's gonna do all these things to make my life miserable. He's gonna take away all my fun. And it's because I didn't understand the heart of God, that the heart of God for you is good. God wants you to be in a city that's run by him, not by people in their own selfish interest. He wants you to experience abundant life, but you have to get up off that seat and give it back to God. He's the only rightful one. Listen, if you're gonna give that seat to anyone, not the social media influencers or your boss or all the voices that say, here's how you can be rich, here's how you can be happy, here's how you can find ultimate fulfillment. Those people don't know or care about you, but Jesus loves you so much, he died in your place. Even when you didn't care about him, he died for you so that you could have this freedom in the gospel. So when we ask you in a moment, if you wanna start a relationship with Jesus, get up out of your seat, literally, we want you to get up out of your seat and say, God, I'm gonna give you my life. I'm gonna give you control of my life. Whatever you say, I will do my best to follow. That's what repentance is. God, I've been doing it my way, but now I choose to do it your way. And not only will your sins be forgiven in that moment, but you'll be given a power, the power of God's spirit to walk in a new way, a new mind, a new creation, an adoption into this beautiful family called the family of God. And that's just the beginning of what God wants to do in your life, but it requires a decision. And so we're gonna play a closing song and we're gonna invite you, if you wanna start a relationship with God through his son, Jesus, if you're ready to repent today and make Jesus king in his rightful place, then we're gonna play the song. We're gonna ask you to stand up and walk this way and stand at this altar. 
And I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer that sounds like this. God, I open my heart. Jesus, I invite you inside. Forgive my sin. I wanna follow you. And that decision will radically alter your life in the best way. So if that's you, and you're ready to receive the forgiveness and grace of God, stand up right now and walk this way and experience this miracle for yourself. Come now, come now. When I call and I confess Now in here I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart And Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My Right now we celebrate with you this decision, the most important decision that you have ever made in your life. And we cannot wait to see what God is gonna do in your life. And so we wanna lead you in a simple prayer. There'll be my words, but this is your expression to God. This is your confession. And as you pray, every sin you've ever committed is gonna be washed away. As Micah said, hurled into the depths of the sea, forgotten because of the grace and mercy of the God who's been pursuing you your entire life. And as he catches you, and as you repent of your sins, he's gonna begin to do the work of new creation in you. A sense of purpose and power and peace and joy that you've never experienced before, and that's just the beginning of this journey. And if you're online, you can pray this prayer with us or just text the word believe to 31352 and just pray this prayer with us and join us in this life-changing moment. So I'm gonna give you the words. Just repeat them out loud after me. Say this. Lord God, I open my heart and I invite you inside. Forgive my sin. Today, I repent. Now fill me with your spirit and I will walk with you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God. So listen, before you go back to your seats, you just made the most important decision of your life and I wanna ask you for five more minutes. So five more minutes to follow along to that open door right there and we were gonna give you a Bible. I'd love to again meet you personally and just celebrate the greatest decision you've ever made. So if you can follow along this way, I'll join you in that room. You'll be back with your friends in a moment. Church, let's stand and give them a hand as they go. And church, let's stand together as we worship now our King Jesus who sits on the throne of heaven and earth and in our lives, he is Lord. Let's worship him together.
We love you guys. If you are in need of prayer, we have a team of people waiting to pray for you right at the front of the stage. You guys have a great weekend. Thank you for joining us on Calvary Chapel Online. If you have not done so already, please go ahead and share your takeaway in the chat of how the Holy Spirit spoke to you. If you're interested in hearing more about Calvary and all the amazing resources that we have, go ahead and check out calvaryftl.org. Until then, have a great weekend.